Lieutenant, do you have anything further for this witness? Your Honor, these are the images for both Bored Ape and Mutant Ape. And there's also a comprehensive website and accompanying film all about the neo-Nazi symbols. I'd like to admit them as defense exhibits A and B. This is ridiculous. Is there any chance this all blew up bigger than you imagined and now you're stuck? No. Is there any chance you're regretting that logo? We are the NFT space, son. We keep making headlines or the whole NFT space collapses. It's that simple. Are we clear? If there's nothing to hide, why are you litigating? You want to be an artist? I think I'm entitled. You want to be an artist? I want the truth. You can handle the truth. Son, we live in a world that loves to ape. The apes have to be fed with visions of massive success. Who's gonna do that? You, you, Lieutenant Ryder. I have a greater responsibility than you can possibly fathom. You sling mud and muck rake for Nazi symbolism. You have that luxury. You have the luxury of not knowing what I know. The bored apes, while cringeworthy, probably keep the entire space alive. And my existence, while grotesque and incomprehensible to you, saves NFTs. You don't want the truth because deep down in places you don't talk about at parties, you want me making bank. You need me making bank. We use words like GM, wag me, wrecked. We use these words as the backbone to a life spent defending something. You use them as a punchline. I have neither the time nor the inclination to explain myself to a man who rises and sleeps under the blanket of the very hype I provide, then questions the manner in which I provide it. I prefer you just said thank you and went on your way. Otherwise, I suggest you pick up a pencil and create something original. Either way, I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. Ah, uh, bored apes. Racist. They are just... JPEGs. Are the bored apes racist? You're goddamn right they are! It's a name you're probably sick of hearing now, and you'd probably rather he went away, but the truth is, Double R has been at this art game longer than you'd imagine, and NFTs are simply the latest internet curiosity he's turned his very specific artistic gaze towards. And you might flinch hearing me calling him an artist, but if you do your homework and cast your disgust to one side, you'll find a human who's made the internet his canvas, or even his brush. I'm never entirely sure, continually questioning our relationship with it through websites, memes, trolling, installations, and everything in between. The New York Times famously called him the consummate internet cool kid back in 2014. Well, he's a kid no longer. And Vice was moved to defend his deeply controversial art whore installation, but he invited two Craigslist casual encounters listees offering sensual bodywork sessions to create art on camera. It was declared one of the most offensive projects of 2014 by Art F. City. And then there was that whole saga with Zara Larson and Azalea Banks. He was her creative director, said some offensive things which Azalea then shared and then she dumped Ryder after being engaged to him for a solitary week. Not to diminish any of that, sorry Zara, but we've got a lot to cover. Oh shit! Yeah! So Ryder's been at this a long time, and there is a certain irony in a community like ours that prides itself on its appreciation of art. Getting so riled up by someone who, I'll be honest, has made me think more about art this week than I have in a very long time. Art has a long history of controversial artists forcing us to think. Now, I'm not sure Ryder's work deserves comparison with Marcel Duchamp or Gilbert and George, but you can't fault him for trying to do something that most other NFT art projects refuse to do. It's a way of life. Like, we don't want that new. We want that new, new. Where does copyright reside? What are we buying when we acquire NFTs? What can we, what are we allowed to do with them? But the real question for me is, 
Has Ryder gone too far this time? With gavel in hand and tiptoeing through the minefield of modern art criticism, this is the defiant. People want to see something different, they want to see something new, and that's what it comes down to. They want to be surprised. They, they want to, they, the internet offers that, where TV doesn't. So we start by casting our minds back a year ago, when the Bored Ape Yacht Club was basically no more than a scrappy Discord channel, 10,000 weird looking monkeys, and not a lot else. But it's important to discuss CryptoPunks and MeBits here. Apes, at the time, were the anti-punks, which were seen as elitist and expensive, the Bitcoin of the PFP world. Those who owned them and used them as their PFPs, seen as a sort of out of reach ruling class of sorts, those who were early. And crucial to this was the copyright, or lack of, implicit in owning one of these. You see, for punks, it wasn't exactly clear. In 2019, Lava Labs announced that they had adopted the NFT license originally created by Dapper Labs for CryptoKitties and then applied it to CryptoPunks and Autoglyphs. They would later apply it to MeBits as well. So under this license, there's no transfer of IP, copyright or trademark to punk owners. However, the art can be used for your own personal, non-commercial use and you can commercialize your own merch up to $100,000 a year, but you're not allowed to modify the art or sell third-party products with it. Clear? Fast forward to 2021 and NFT fever is in full swing. Apes have discovered that their JPEGs come with some unexpected benefits. You can exploit the IP. And that gives us Snoop, Timberland, Eminem, and Seth Green, all investing in the individual value of their own specific items within the collection. And if you want to understand why this is so profound, then we covered it in depth in our recent stream with Bill Starkoff and the team behind Fringe. As entrepreneurs begin investing in the micro business of their ape, it lends luster to the entire collection. We all win, or at least that's the theory. The difference between this approach and the restrictive license of punks is almost certainly one of the most pertinent reasons why Bored Apes blew up the way they did. Now feast your eyes on this, Punk 3100. Now you've no doubt seen more than enough punks to last you a lifetime, but that is not a punk. It's a Rider Rip original. It's a statement piece. Welcome to the annoying world of conceptual art, he declaims. In the description, Ryder criticizes the lack of humanity present in the punk collection. He says, My resale of Punk 3100 is newer, more human, has more meaning, and is more punk than the Lava Labs one. I'm sorry, the voices, they just come out like that. Result, a DMCA takedown notice and cease and desist email from Lava Labs, which the enterprising Ryder immediately minted as NFTs, of course. Now his goal here as you can probably understand, is provocation. Now I have heard from an inside source that Lava Labs is planning a full on assault on me. Bring it on! They are jealous, jealous that I turned their dumb computer generated commercial design project into art. No, I, I really don't think they were. But anyway, Ryder would argue that his work is transformative, that the accompanying discourse, both from himself and others, provides the context to support that claim, which is why you see him on social media so very, very much. It's Warhol's soup cans all over again. Guess what, though? He won. The DMCA was withdrawn. Right-click savers had a new hero. And speaking of, you are all heroes in my book for subscribing to the channel, and if you're not, then you can become a newly minted hero of the Defiant by doing exactly that, so hit that, oh, you know. Now, heroes of a different sort, our sponsors. I'll be right back. Do you know how much money you made in DeFi? Valk introduces Merlin, your institutional grade DeFi portfolio tracker. Simply connect your wallets and access your net worth, yield earned, P&L, total debts, transaction fees for each of your historical positions in USD. From lending on Ava or Trader Joe to getting a full overview of your LP positions on Uniswap V3. Make smarter DeFi trading decisions with Merlin. Sign up now for early access before the public launch on July the 1st. Link in the description. 
In 2021, Ethereum traders lost over $200 million to malicious bots exploiting their trades. As DeFi continues to gain popularity, this number is expected to rise. Eden Network is a next-generation private transaction service for Ethereum, providing traders with MEV protection by submitting transactions directly to miners and away from the prying eyes of harmful bots. Using Eden Network for Ethereum transactions results in better and safer trades. Eden Network recently launched Eden Rocket RPC, which compiles some of Ethereum's fastest private transaction networks, resulting in 90% plus effective hash rate. This makes Eden Rocket RPC the fastest private transaction network available, protecting you from bots. Join the best and get started with Eden Network today and trade safer. Is your crypto sitting idle without earning you any passive income? On Nexo, you can maximize the value of your crypto in no time and earn rates of up to 17%. Their web platform and mobile app are super easy to use. You can buy crypto with your card instantly and start earning interest paid out daily. The Nexo exchange has over 300 market pairs. Every time you swap or buy crypto, you get up to 0.5% cash back that's automatically added to your wallet. If you want to finance buying a car or a trip to a faraway place, you can borrow cash by using your crypto or NFT is collateral. You don't lose your crypto and you can get borrowing rates as low as 0% APR. Go to nexo.io and get started today. So it's three days before Christmas 2021 and something truly significant happens. Apes flip punks and Ryder girds his artistic loincloth for an even bigger battle. Apes helpfully provide no shortage of material to poke fun at. Jimmy Fallon and Paris Hilton, anyone? Ryder created Dump Dot FM, way back when, which was an exciting tool for the internet, allowing pictures to be used for real-time communication and collaboration. Memes replacing text as a means of communication. This, believe it or not, is literally ground zero for the primary means of expression online now, not just in crypto. Spend even a few minutes on 4chan and you will feel the legacy of Dump FM. Ryder really knows internet culture. So when he saw the rich and baffling symbology of bored apes, it presented an irresistible target and he swung into action. The neo-Nazi narrative was born, alleging the whole collection to be a giant 4chan flavored alt-right troll, which of course Twitter completely lapped up. Those who despised NFTs found firmer ground for their outrage, while those who liked NFTs but found bored ape owners obnoxious found firmer grounds for their outrage. Win-win, for Ryder. Remember, the louder the discourse, the greater the proof of this work being transformative. And this is probably an apt moment for a little tiny, tiny sidebar on appropriation art. In other words, using objects or images with little to no transformation and repackaging them as original art. This is nothing new really, but it was accelerated by the internet where everything becomes a remix and becomes a remix incredibly fast. And for the most part, this is all actually completely fine, except when someone starts making real money from it. Recontextualization is the key word here, lending new meaning to the images, despite them being pretty much identical. Now fast forward to NFT NYC 2022, and those neo-Nazi allegations surface once more as YouTuber Filion releases an hour-long documentary that makes some pretty uncomfortable viewing. It's unethical, the practice of, of having inside jokes that are so fucked up to people who don't even understand them and like and, and basically making fun of people to their face, right? Uh, to me, that that's really what's fucked up. And, and it's more fun. It's actually more to me. That's the crime here. The crime isn't that they're Nazis and they're racist, which they might be. And, and I'm sure they are accelerationists who are people who are just basically nihilists who don't give a fuck and want to see the world burn. And like, to me, that's probably a worse thing than being anything because you really are anti-human. So that video is up to 1.2 million views and counting. It was dominating the conversation just as the apes were making their triumphant return to New York with the four day ape fest. The timing was impeccable and it led to the burn bake B-A-Y-C meme on Twitter, and tucked alongside it came double R B-A-Y-C, which is the moment Ryder might have just gone too far. He says, 
On Wednesday, May 13th, 2022, I began creating new work in the form of NFTs based on the BAYC images. Through the process of re-minting, the original BAYC images are recontextualized, illuminating truths about their origins and meanings as well as the nature of Web3. The power of NFTs to change meaning, establish provenance and evade censorship. RRBOYC uses satire and appropriation to protest and educate people regarding the Bald Ape Yacht Club and the framework of NFTs. The work is an extension of and in the spirit of other artists who have worked within the field of appropriation art. And again, that would have been absolutely fine, except for the fact that he sold them. And they blew up. At least, well, you could buy them anyway. OpenSea and X2Y2 delisted them, but looks rare, did not. Ryder attempted, good soul that he is, to set the royalties to zero everywhere, which is nice of him. But the collection was sold in primary, and it did make money on primary, over a million dollars, in fact. All off the back of ape artwork. And appropriately enough now, we can circle back to 4chan and a post from the 1st of May. Let's turn NFT into a racial slur. It will make all the people trying to get rich off this shit, especially celebs and influencers, really, really fucking mad. The author of that post alleged, alleged, ledge, to be Ryder Rips. So Ryder the Provocateur did what Ryder the Provocateur does and sprayed his spleen everywhere all over the internet. But did he really believe it when he said this? Well, Sue, they have, and that is where we find ourselves today. Objection! The suit accuses the self-proclaimed conceptual artist Ryder Rips of trying to devalue the board Ape pieces by flooding the NFT market with his own copycat NFT collection using the original board Ape Yacht Club images. Flooding the market, you see. <laughs> This is no mere monkey business, it continues. It is a deliberate effort to harm Yuga Labs at the expense of consumers. Oh, those poor consumers. By sowing confusion about whether these double R BAYC NFTs are in some way sponsored, affiliated, or connected to Yuga Labs' official Board Ape Yacht Club. Okay, so I've often found myself pushing the boundaries of copyright infringement in the past, but always in the name of Parody. I've actually received cease and desist notices from Simon Cowell, of all people. But there was always this fair use defense to fall back on. Fair use is basically a limitation to copyright intended to balance the interests of copyright holders with the public interest in the wider distribution and use of creative works by allowing, as a defense to copyright infringement, claims that certain limited uses that might otherwise be considered infringement. So, in the public interest, sometimes you can get away with it. That's the Wikipedia definition. And if you scroll down, you find a pretty chunky section on parody, where the use is designed to poke fun at or comment on the work itself. And that is most likely the line Ryder's defense will take. But the thing about fair use is it's never, ever clear cut. Objection, this testimony completely ruins my case. Now, in case it wasn't abundantly clear, I am not a lawyer. So to understand what's going on here, I spoke to Brian L. Fry, whose official title is Spears Gilbert Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. But he was adamant that we title him Deutschkorn Professor of Law and Griffin. Web3. Web3. So I had some questions. First amongst which was, does Yuga have a case? Yes. Yuga appears to have a solid claim for trademark infringement against Ryder Rips. Basically, trademark law protects distinctive marks that provide information about the source of a product or service. The marks claimed by Yuga, like Board Ape Yacht Club, BAYC, and various logos, are pretty clearly distinctive and function as marks. While they aren't yet registered, Yuga has filed registration applications that almost certainly will eventually be granted. In any case, trademark law explicitly provides that trademark owners can sue for infringement of unregistered marks, which is the basis for Yuga's claims. Yuga has pleaded evidence that Ryder Rips used its marks to sell NFTs of the exact same images for which it sold NFTs. In a nutshell, Yuga is arguing that Ryder Rips effectively announced, I'm selling counterfeit Board Ape Yacht Club NFTs. That's textbook trademark infringement. I fear that courts are unlikely to be sympathetic to the argument that it was intended as conceptual art. 
So in the suit, what's remarkable is that there's no claim for copyright infringement, but the thing is, why not? Well, for one thing, they couldn't. Under the Copyright Act, you can't file a copyright infringement action unless and until you've registered the allegedly infringed work with the Copyright Office. Yuga hasn't registered any of the Board API Club images it created, although several NFT owners have. So Yuga can't sue for copyright infringement of those images until it files a registration application on them and the Copyright Office acts on the application. For another thing, it's not clear how copyright applies to the Board API Club images or whether Yuga is the copyright owner in the first place. The fact that the images are automatically generated mashups of different elements raises some questions about the scope of copyright protection in the images, which at best is probably pretty narrow in each particular image anyway. What's more, it seems that Yuga may have either transferred copyright ownership of those images to the NFT owners, or at least given them exclusive licenses, which might limit its ability or would limit its ability to, to file copyright infringement actions, even if it did register the images. Does Ryder have any defense here, and how might he look to resolve the suit? I think it will be very hard for Ryder Rips to defend himself against Yuga's trademark infringement claims because he really seems to have done his best to tick off every box for trademark infringement. I think his best argument would be some kind of trademark fair use defense that he used the Board API Club marks nominatively or in order to, to parody them. Unfortunately for Rips, Yuga presents evidence that he used the marks in a way that implied that what he was selling was real. Board API Club NFTs, and that the source of the NFTs he was selling was in fact uh, was in fact Board API Club. Uh, also, I, I think that courts are likely to see what Writer Rips is doing as effectively telling consumers, "I am selling counterfeit Board API Club NFTs," and and that's not a nominative use. While the consumers who buy counterfeit goods aren't necessarily con confused about what they're getting themselves. Selling counterfeit goods is still trademark infringement because when the goods go onto secondary markets, for example, uh, they might be perceived by other com consumers as, as being real. And also there's this idea that when you're selling counterfeit goods, that consumers are buying those counterfeit goods precisely because they know that they're indistinguishable or largely indistinguishable from legitimate, genuine goods. So from the outside, this infringement suit feels really like a cover for a different kind of shut the hell up action to stop Ryder propagating this neo-Nazi narrative. Couldn't Yuga have just waited for it all to blow over though? Why act now? It's a good question. From the outside, it looks like Yuga was worried about Ryder Rips's criticisms of their project. Uh, understandably, because his criticisms are pretty serious, uh, I can't help thinking they're using this trademark infringement action as a way of essentially forcing Ryder Rips to shut up. For better or worse, Ryder Rips' personal exposure to damages here is pretty substantial, uh, potentially millions of dollars. Uh, I suspect Yuga hopes to make a deal with him where they forego financial damages in exchange for Ryder Rips promising to stop criticizing them and making allegations that they're racist Nazis. Uh, the problem is that it may be too late. The cat's out of the bag. Others can still advance the same criticisms that Ryder Rips is making, even if Ryder Rips agrees not to make those criticisms himself. And the more attention this lawsuit gets, the more play Rips' criticisms will receive. If Yuga's goal is to tamp down the racist Nazi narrative that Ryder Rips is pushing, this lawsuit at least risks a Streisand effect, uh, potentially drawing attention to the very criticisms that they're hoping to, to suppress. So it's a risky move. So there's no doubt we are witnessing a real-time retooling of the notions of intellectual property and copyright in Web3. Ryder argues that defining what we are buying when we purchase an NFT is one of the primary goals of his work. The current terms of ownership, as he says, set forth by Yuga Labs to BAYC token holders are unclear and do not meet current copyright standards. But maybe the suit says that they do and maybe Ryder just overstepped. Nobody really had to think about this before because none of this space really had any value, but with Yuga raising at a $4 billion valuation, you'd best believe it matters now. Jimmy McNellis has been instrumental in the architecture of many of the most prominent NFT projects of the last few years through his company NFT42, thinking of vFriends, for instance. And he's the driving force behind an ape music project, Kingship, 
at Universal, and he knows the Yuga team personally. So how has his thinking evolved around IP rights during that time? I think clarity around IP rights for NFT holders is important for collectors. I've no doubt that these tokens are instruments to convey IP licenses for copyrighted material, but there's a lot of uncertainty in the space. I believe this is primarily because the vast majority of collectors have never had to learn and understand the nuance surrounding copyright laws. I'm a great example of that. Prior to my exposure to NFTs, I never thought about copyright. That changed for me in 2018 with CryptoKitties and eventually in creating Avastars in 2019-2020, which comes with a license for commercial use by the project's holders. In this context, I believe precedent has been set since 2018 when Dapper Labs first created the NFT license with limited commercial rights and has been strengthened with each project that has adopted a form of commercial rights for the holders. The intent of the industry and these projects is clear. A conveyance of rights attached to NFTs. Art theft has been, I mean, let's be honest, a major problem in the NFT world since the very beginning. DeviantArt is a platform that claims to have completely solved this through custom AI tools that detect infringement and automatically alert the owners. Now, I spoke to a representative of DeviantArt off the record, and he told me that the site has processed over 300,000 DMCA takedown requests by artists whose art had been stolen and resold unfairly as an NFT. Far from pushing back against Web3, however, Deviant are in fact looking to become part of the solution by creating a fully decentralized protocol for trust-related concerns around NFTs. It's called Protect Protocol, and it allows artists to upload their images and be informed when an infringement occurs with an automatic DMCA notice sent to the offending party. Now, if you are worried about how far you can push your IP rights, there are projects set up using CC0, which is currently the most restriction-free version of licensing possible. As they say, CT0 enables scientists, educators, artists, and other creators and owners of copyright or database protected content to waive those interests in their works and thereby place them as completely as possible in the public domain so that others may freely build upon, enhance, and reuse the works for any purposes without restriction under copyright or database law. So you can basically do whatever you want. MFers, Goblin Town nouns, cryptodes, and the evergreen crypto dick butts, well, all CC0. So it doesn't have to be so contentious, but then no collection is worth quite as much as the Yuga originated pieces. Many are painting this as a landmark case for the NFT space, setting precedents. But I was curious whether Brian saw it that way. I guess I suspect that one thing it will show is that most of the value of NFT collections is in the brand of the collection as a whole, rather than copyright in particular images or the distinctiveness of those particular images. Ultimately, copyright and trademark doctrine don't have much to say about NFTs or the NFT market specifically, any more than they have anything to say about the traditional fine art market or traditional fine art. They still apply, but often kind of obliquely and maybe not in ways that the markets necessarily understand, care about, or, or predict. I think the interesting question is whether and why the NFT market cares about copyright and trademark in the first place. So, like many of you, I am sure I went into this film ready to skewer Rider Rips as satire or even parody. I actually think the RRBAYC collection is a pretty weak effort. It's little more than a troll. But I cannot deny the point he's making. Art should make us feel something. And if that's outrage, well, then he succeeded. Swinging the axe of litigation to make him shut up also feels deeply contrary to the spirit of Web3. Imagine Yuga embracing R-R-B-A-Y-C as part of the mythology of Bored Apes, the grand tapestry, holding their hands up and saying, yeah, you got us. We never thought it would blow up this big. We were trolling big time. Imagine that. It would never happen, of course. But what kind of message would that send? Instead, it's, as you were, litigation and shut the fuck up. Some, I'm sure, would argue that you could really had no choice, but there is always a choice. Personally, I think Ryder misstepped charging for the collection at primary, taking a royalty and then diverting that towards promoting best practices and NFT licensing. Well, that might have made more sense, but what's done is done. I also feel he could have taken a journalistic approach, presenting his findings about the neo-Nazi symbols to the Yuga team privately and giving them a chance to respond, but he didn't. He went for maximum sensation. In the suit, 
Fenwick demeans Ryder as a self-proclaimed conceptual artist, but this is false. Forbes actually gave him the moniker in their 30 under 30 list. And you may not like his art, but he's been doing this a lot longer than most of the newly minted NFT art superstars. And I do think he deserves to be heard every bit as much as the apes. Although, Jimmy disagrees with me here. His harmful behavior, accusing another Jewish person than their entire company of being Nazis is not art. It is harassment. We should not celebrate this. Today, it takes very little research into the founding team at Yuga to put together the pieces and realize there is zero basis to the false narrative he has created. Keep in mind, when he first made these allegations, we, the public, knew very little about the Board Ape founders, but as a result of this situation, they've been doxxed and further doxxed themselves. So what seemed possible initially cannot continue to be seen as valid given the mountain of information that points to the contrary. Calling whatever this is art is frankly an insult to the institution of art. This is simply trollish behavior meant to harm. And so to the final burning question, is the Bored Apes collection racist? Well, let's ask this. Is it run through with imagery that can be interpreted as neo-Nazi? Well, the answer is, yes, it can. But so too is Harry Potter. In a post-truth fake news world, every and all interpretations are simultaneously correct and incorrect. So yes, Yuga is racist, and no, Yuga is not racist. Both are true, and ultimately it's down to you, humble viewer, to decide for yourself what flavor of truth you'd like on your fact burger today. In the past week, we've had ape flavored drops from two major black recording artists, Snoop with Eminem and Timberland, and it would be great to hear their thoughts one of these days. The author of the hour-long documentary, Filion, seems to be determined to go further, to go deeper, to go harder. This is not the end of this story, as much as we all might like it to be. And on that deeply unsatisfying note, it's time for me to go wash my hands of the whole sorry affair from the dark side of the web. This was The Defiant. <laughs>